are the everlasting God. And what you have done for others, we know that you will do for us. And we may be facing some very serious and difficult times. But we know your word says that you know what we have need of even before we ask you. We ask you today to help us. We came to worship at your feet and to receive a word in our lives. We need you, God. Give us an ear to hear and a heart that's open and receptive to your word that we might be better because of it. Let your Holy Spirit move in and out every aisle and touch the life of every person present. And we believe that we receive good as a result of it in Jesus' name. All that agree with that prayer said, amen, amen. God bless you. Well, open with me, if you would, in your Bible to the book of Hebrews chapter 12. If you're joining us on Facebook, we welcome you. We thank you for being here. We believe that God's got a good word for you today. Give an ear to hear what the Spirit of God says, and we know you will be blessed. We're continuing a series that I started uh, about three weeks ago, and this is the, actually the third part in the series of overcoming the obstacle. And the basis of this message is the book of Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15. Um, I believe with all of my heart, the message that I'll preach today, preach today is one of the most powerful messages you might ever hear. And I don't say that to bring any attention to myself, but to encourage you that this message, if you take it to heart, can literally change your life. In Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 15, the Bible says that we are to look diligently lest any one of us fall short of the grace of God. Unless any root of bitterness springing up trouble us and as a result other people around us will be defiled. This is so critical because everything we receive in life is by the grace of God. Grace is absolutely one of the most important subjects to us as believers. To not understand it really is to miss out on a very, very critical part of life. It is by grace that we are saved and healed and delivered and preserved and prospered. To fall short of that is to experience life less than God intended for you. It's not based on merit for you to experience peace in a relationship or promotion on the job or financial prosperity or physical healing. All of that is received because of the grace of God. To fall short of that would mean instead of health in your body, you'll experience sickness. Instead of salvation, you'll be in trouble and, and hardly be rescued. You'll, you'll be bound by addictions and, and, and things that have bondage in your life. Things will be lost from you. Things will be stolen and taken and not preserved. And, and you'll, you'll, you'll lack. You won't have the money that you need to even do some of the basic things in life. All because... Not because of your sin. It never was about your sin. Jesus was about your sin. But you would fall short all because of this one issue in life. What is it that could cause us to fall short of this tremendous gift from God? According to this verse of scripture, he says that we are to carefully look on the inside of ourselves for this one thing called a root of bitterness. Because if this is left in us, it will cause us to fail of the grace of God. It'll spring up. It'll cause us to react in ways. It'll pop up in our lives when we least expect it. And it'll even not only trouble us, but it'll cause other people around us to be in trouble. So we're talking about in this series overcoming the obstacle particularly focusing on this issue of bitterness. I looked up the word, you know, 
You start looking at something long enough, you start to think, do you really know what it is? I found something very interesting. This word bitterness comes from a Greek word that means acridity. Uh, our youngest brother, he's the executive pastor. Uh, he's with the youth right now. He went to private school, so he probably knows what that meant. <laughs> I went to public school. So I had to look up what acridity meant. Lest the root of acridity, because I don't know what it is, springs up and troubles me. I looked it up. It's defined as sharp and harsh and unpleasantly pungent in taste or odor and causing a burning feeling. So in the Greek, he said, lest the root of acridity spring up and trouble you and, and thereby other people def be defiled. In looking it up in the Greek, this acridity is meant literally and figuratively. Literally, acridity is a strong smell, a harsh smell. Have you ever smelled something that it was so bad that it caused your nose to burn? There are things that can actually, you have a physical irritation as a result of the smell of it. But think about that figur figuratively. Is there somebody, if they were to walk in the door right now, that would cause you a burning feeling in your heart because of a bad situation that took place? Are there things in your life that are so sharp, sharp things cut, cuts, our wounds. And when you're talking about the matter of the heart, sharp things that hit your heart can wound you and leave you in a bad way. Harsh things. You know, we talk about the hardening of arteries. But what about the hardening of the heart? You know, it's one thing for your, your arteries to become hardened, but what if your heart got hard? And it's so possible in life that we can experience things that causes parts of our heart to absolutely be hardened. These are bitterness. So in talking about this, I really challenge you to give yourself to this series. If you weren't here for the first two parts, go back. You can look at it again on Facebook. You can go online and catch up with us. But you don't want to leave this series and didn't get it because this is a matter of life. Number one and two dealt with overcoming the obstacle of self. We base that on the reality that God said no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Not your problem. Your boss, your employer, the company that you work for, the people that are around you, though you might think that they're the ones that are causing you from experiencing the life that God intended for you. People are not your problem. They don't have that kind of power over you if you belong to God. The reality, though, it could be is that you are your own problem. Someone said that the enemy is the inner me. And oftentimes that's the case that's keeping you from the destiny, the better life that God has for you. You trip you up from your next promotion and from your next level. It shows up in anger. It shows up in unhappiness. Go back and listen to that. But today we're going to talk about history, overcoming the obstacle of history. Next week, and I, I will be here next week, uh, we're going to talk about over in the, overcoming the obstacle of Babel. And that's as it relates to communication. And then the last part of this series is overcoming the obstacle of money. How many of y'all like track and field? Amen. Amen. One of, uh, one of the uh, teenagers in the church is, is, is right in the midst of track season right now. Just did the 100 meter in the two, 100 yard and 200 yard and came in second place. And really excited about that. Amen. Well, track and field, one of the events is called hurdling. 100 meter hurdles and the 400 meter hurdles. Didn't know. I thought it was 100 meter and 200 meter, but they even have hurdles for 400 meters. The object here is that everybody is in a race and they're running for that prize to finish that, that race. All of us, if whether we understand it or not, are in a race for our lives. There's a finish line that we should be pressing towards. 
But what if as we're running, there are obstacles in our way or, or as we see, what if there are hurdles between you and the better life that God has for you? Those hurdles literally can keep you from finishing the race or even slow you down from finishing at the time in which you are supposed to finish. What I'm challenging you today is to learn how to overcome the obstacles in life and particularly how to overcome the obstacle of history. I would have loved to have tagged this series as a marriage series. I have been ministering um, since 1996, so that would be 23 years, and I've been around church all my life. I've seen, you know, marriages in the church, out of the church. I'm certified as a marriage counselor. I counsel marriages even to this day. And the greatest thing that I've ever seen in marriage as an obstacle for that family to have peace is people can't get past the past. I'm preaching in this quiet church today. <laughs> people can't get past past history. And it literally, history prevents them from achieving God's best in their life. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 19, the Bible says, husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Bitterness is a real enemy of you. And it's true that, that you know, a husband, because maybe some interactions, I know for me, um, respect is a big deal. I know my wife loves me, but what, what really registers is when she respects me. And if, if there is an occasion where I feel disrespected, immediately I want to shut down. You know, I, she said that in front of the, the waitress or, you know, she said that in front of, you know, a family member. Or she said that in front of, you know, this situation and, and, you know, call it my ego, call it what you want. But I know you got your thing. <laughs> but in that moment. My heart hurts and I want to shut down. Ah, Let's talk about it. What is bitterness? Just so you'll understand. Bitterness is betrayal's baby. P.B. Wilson wrote a book, and in this book she described in a dream hearing this baby crying in the distance, and it was a, a figurative. God was ministering to her, and he basically revealed to her that bitterness in us is betrayal's baby. It cries out. The essence of that is when someone close to you that you didn't expect does something that you didn't expect. You know, for example, a stranger saying something smart to me or disrespectful to me, don't bother me, right? But a loved one, a friend, a co-worker, a colleague, a church member, right? They say something, and I, didn't, I wasn't expecting them to call me that or to treat me like that. But because someone close to me that I didn't expect said something to me that I didn't expect, as a result of that moment, conception takes place in the heart because of the failed expectation, bitterness is sown as a seed, and if allowed, will grow as a root and it'll spring up in the form of anger towards or unhappiness with and in life. Bitterness is betrayal's baby. Oh, you'll like this one. Uh, P.B. Wilson in the same book, she described seeing in a dream this living room and in this, this living room there was a mantle and on the mantle there were a bunch of clocks. Maybe the person liked clocks and was collecting clocks.
that In, a, in either case, it's something that has to be dealt with in life. Again, I, I didn't call this a marriage series because this hits us all. Family relationships. There are things that we're mad about in this country because of things that have happened in our history that prevent us from being where we're supposed to be. Amen. In Ephesians chapter 6 and verse number 4, it says, And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Parenting can have such an impact on a child's life that it can cause them to be bitter. And as a, as a result of how you conducted yourself as a parent, now you, they've, they've got bitterness in them and it springs up in wrath or in anger. How many of y'all see this applies to all relationships? So how do you clear history? And all, for all of us, how many of you ever used the internet? Okay, nobody. Well, okay, there were some more hands. Well, if you use the internet, in order to access the internet, you have to have a browser, uh, whether it be you know Safari or Internet Explorer or Firefox or, or, or whatever it is. You got to have a browser. And what's interesting about the browser is, is one of the tabs, one of the menu buttons, is history. And what's interesting on history and see every site that you visited today, every site that you visited over the last seven days, the last 30 days, etc. And in your heart, you can record history in the same way. Ooh, I'm preaching good. Amen. You can remember it'll be an obstacle for you in completing God's destiny for your life. But at the, at the, somewhere in that browser, when you click menu, at the bottom or somewhere, there will be a button or a tab where you can say clear history. Wow. You can literally wipe out every place that you have. know. Something happened to me this week. I experienced, experienced a failed expectation. I knew instantly. I mean, I felt it. You know, when something happens or doesn't happen that you expect, amen, you feel it. And the moment I knew instantly that because of what we've been seeing and learning recently, that if I don't process what took place even this past week, that even I, as the teacher of this lesson, could end up becoming or having a root of bitterness. I felt it. And the first thing I thought is, woof, I need to deal with this. How do you overcome the root of bitterness when something happens that fa fails your, your expectation? So, <clears throat> so the Lord literally walked me through 
this process. He brought an illustration to my mind about uh, fertilizers and, and weeds, which we were talking about a root like a weed. There's something bad in your life that pops up and different chemicals that you can apply. And one of the things that the chemical application of fertilizers and other things, you can literally stop the germination process of a seed that's even been sown. Oh, I'm preaching better than you saying amen today. The germination process, if a seed is sown and given the proper elements, it will produce no matter what. However, you can alter the environment, you can alter the surroundings and even the seed itself and prevent it from ever taking root. You can have the seed sown, but never the root nor the fruit. Come on, somebody. And the Lord showed me that what happened was in me as a seed and walked me through a German, uh, uh, the prevention of a germination process. And I want to show you that through how to clear history if you're going to clear history, number one, you've got to forgive. You all want the long version or the short, short version? Somebody said the long version. All right. Longs have it. Amen. We just had a church vote. <laughs> Hardly ever have those. Amen. We just had one. Amen. But I, I, I don't want you to miss this. It'll be simple, and then we'll go on for our day. But I, 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 you got to get this. When that happened, I knew the first thing that I had to do, and the Lord walked me through step by step, and I didn't know about the third step, so watch this. I knew I had to forgive that person, that situation, that, 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 that organization, whatever it was. I had to forgive. I wish I had the time. I could literally do a whole series, and there's books written about forgiveness. There's series. I mean, we could take weeks just to study how often and how much the Word of God says about forgiveness. Whether it's in a spousal relationship or a family relationship, if you're going to experience the better life God has for you, you are going to have to forgive what they did. That's how to clear history. In Matthew chapter 18, Jesus had this question asked to him. Peter said to him, came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him up to seven times? Now, when you think about this, it's a real question. He had a legitimate question. He says, Jesus, how often shall somebody call? Is real close to you. The Bible talks about that, you know, brothers are real close and there's one that will even sit closer and, and so forth. But the reality, he's just saying not just in a brother or a family relationship, but anybody that's close to you. How long should I let somebody say something, do something in my life and I forgive them seven times? I thought he thought he was being degenerous. <laughs> Jesus said to him, I don't say unto you seven times, but up to 70 times seven, that's 490 times. I don't believe that he intended it for you to count up how many, now this is, this, hey, now this is 479, brother. <laughs> you got a few more, man. Then there is the inference in another passage in the same occasion where the question was asked and Jesus implied that it would be 490 times in the same day. Have you ever somebody, have you ever had somebody in your life cross a line with you more than once on the same day? If you've ever said that you about to work my last nerve, <laughs> then you've had somebody who's crossed the line. More than one time in the same day. And just so you know, he says, how often shall my brother sin against me? Sin is trespass. Trespass is when you cross a line that you're not, you're not supposed to cross. It's real, especially in marriage relationships. And when you get up in the morning next to that person, there's plenty of opportunity in 24 hours for them to cross lines with you. Do things that you don't expect. But in each occasion, Jesus said, forgive them. And not if they ask you for forgiveness. Forgive them whether they ask you or not. Who is quiet? You say, well, how can I do this? 
You can do this because of Ephesians chapter 1, chapter 5 and verse 1. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 1 says, therefore, be imitators of God as dear children. How many of y'all know God is in the forgiveness business? If anybody knows anything about forgiveness. shouldn't do I want to know how can God he the there is the ability for you to do In Psalm 103, to have an example of God, and this is the last verse on this note. So we're moving right along. In Psalm 103, 2 and 3, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your iniquities and heals, what? All your diseases. Notice the word all. It means everything, and it leaves out nothing. How many of your iniquities does God forgive? He forgives all of them. And if you especially in a marriage, are going to get to the place where you truly enjoy it, where you're back to being in love again. You're going to have to learn how to clear history. And the first step is you got to forgive. The second step to clearing history, oh, this is the tough one. That's okay, because I got several scriptures for this one. You got to forget about it. I Googled this last night. How many have ever heard this, I'll forgive, but I'll never forget? Mm -hmm. I'll forgive you, but I'll never forget. And I'm going to say it with bitterness. (laughs) Matter of fact, when I started Googling it, it popped up, forgive, not forget tattoos. People literally have it tattooed across their body, I won't forgive and never forget. I'll never forget. Yeah. Forgive, but I'll never forget. And they literally, they're marking that moment in yeah. time where somebody did something to me. They remember it. The smell of it, it reminds them. And that bitterness, they, they can't be okay with that person because of that moment. They forgave them, yeah. You got to watch what you say because your words have power. You'll end up remembering it because you said you wouldn't forget it. <laughs> so let's get into this because don't be that person who will forgive somebody but will never forget it. In Isaiah 43 and 25, God said, of course, imitate God as dear children. Notice what he says in Isaiah 43. He says, I, and this is God speaking. This ain't Isaiah. This ain't Jeremiah. This is God himself. He says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. This is a powerful passage. Why? Because notice the first part is God says as it relates to you. And there are several places when you talk about forgiveness. There are several places where God says, if you don't forgive your brother, your his trespasses, then how can God forgive you of your trespasses? Matter of fact, when Peter pointed out, God, you know, how is it that if my brother sinned against me, how many times Jesus said, not only should you forgive him, but forgive him up to 70 times seven. Literally, the next verse says there was a story of a guy who owed a man just a ton of money. And it came, called him on it and the guy pleaded and the guy forgave him. But then that guy left and immediately found somebody who would owed him a little money and the guy held it against him. Put him in prison until he paid it. God says, I'm the one that blots out your transgressions for my own sake. He uses himself as an example so that you can use that as an example for your life. What do you mean you blot out? Anybody remember blot out with uh, white out? You know, we hardly use, you know, word processors and typewriters. But back in the day, they, they made white out. Do they still make white yeah. No, they, so they do still make white out. But praise God, what you did was you, if you made a mistake, you can, 
you know, white it out and then write on top of that or type on top of that. But notice, he says, I blot out your transgressions from my own. Say, I wonder what he uses. Come on. He, you, I wonder, 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 wonder what, what bottle of white out is big enough for God. Hey, he uses the blood of Jesus. Come on to blot out your transgressions. And then he goes one step beyond forgiveness because the first part is forgiveness. But then he says, I will not remember your sins. Now, one of the things that makes God God is that he's omnipotent, omniscient and omnipresent, which means he's all powerful, all knowing and everywhere at the same time. Right. God knows as omniscient, he knows everything about the past, everything that happens to the present and knows everything about the future all at the same time. But notice he doesn't say, I cannot remember your sins. Notice he didn't say, I do not remember what you did. What does he say? I will not. As an act of his will, he chooses not to remember. He chooses to forget what you've done. Oh, it's so quiet. So don't be the one that says, I'll forgive you, but I'll never forget. No, be the one that imitates God. And how does he do? He forgives people their trespasses and he chooses as an act of his will to not remember it. That means it comes up before him and says, nope, I don't remember that. I will not remember that. Come on, have you ever had somebody talking to you and you didn't really want to hear what they were saying? Ah, la, 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 la. You, don't mind, what you're you talk to the hands because the ears are not listening. <laughs> You are refusing to hear it. You're refusing to be reminded. Come on, y'all help me now, because I'm trying to help you get to the place. Because if you're ever going to get to your next level, it's not the person that you're married to that's keeping you. It's how you process what they do that keeps you from where you want to be. Somebody say, I will not remember it. I choose to forget. In the same chapter of Isaiah 43 and 25, in 43 and 18, he commands you this. He says, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Plug that into a marriage, somebody, because it's in those arguments, you know, you, you did this and, and this is the 14th time you did that. And, I, you know, I can't just stand because this is how you are. It's just how he is, Pastor. I just need you to help me understand. How can anybody be with somebody like that? I mean, they just got a track record. They just got a history and I'm just tired. I'm tired Pastor. Can't you see it? I'm tired. <laughs> the biggest obstacle I've ever seen in counseling marriages is they can't get past the past. But if you do this thing the way God teaches you, if you look diligently to remove the root of bitterness, and if you know how to click and clear history, you'll forgive them every time they do it, and then you'll choose to forget. It shouldn't be you that we were and then remember. We're almost done. He says. That's the same thing that I did yesterday, which was the same thing I did before we got married and the same thing I did while we were dating. And it was saying, don't bring that up to me. If I mess up today, let's try. Hurt your. Communicate with it connected to the past. I'm not, you know, creating an environment for you to be anybody's floor mat. If they step on your toes, let them know that hurts. Please don't do that. Let's talk about present tense issues, but it shouldn't be in the shadow of the mountain of the past. Am I helping anybody today? Yes. First Corinthians chapter 13, talking about how does God love? In 1 Corinthians 13, the whole chapter is about the love of God. Notice this about the love of God. It is not conceited, arrogant, inflated with pride. It's not rude, unmannerly, does not act unbecomingly. Loves God's love in us, does not insist on its own rights or its own way. For it is not self-seeking, it's not touchy, fretful, or resentful. Notice this part. 
It takes no account of the evil done to it. It does what? Pays no attention to a suffered wrong. Notice what I put in bold. Love, God's love in us. If we love our spouse and our, our brothers and our family and we love people the way that God loves us, even when they wrong us, we won't take an account of it. You know what? That seems like literally or figuratively, you know what? I'm going to make a note of that. See? Because you done, you done did it again. Come on, somebody. Oh, I'm going to make a note of that, right? And then you keep this, whether it's on a physical list or in your heart, you keep this log of how many times they've hurt you, how many times they've done this to you, and you keep this log going, and guess what? They're keeping you from where you want to be because you won't deal with this. God's love doesn't take account of the evil done to it. He doesn't keep a track of how many times you've sinned. And think about it. There's some things in our lives that we've done again and again and again before we were saved, after we were saved. We did it last night. Come on, somebody. The reality of it is God doesn't love us by keeping account. You might feel unworthy. Come on. You might feel. And, and, and you know what? That feeling of unworthiness for some of us is the very thing that's keeping us from our next level. Because we think that God is holding against us what we did in our past. That way, I'm not going to accept the call of God on my life to do a big thing because I knew how bad I was in the past. Listen, child of God, he doesn't remember what you did. He refuses to re be reminded of it. But guess who is hurt? Guess who the hurdle is keeping from that? Night? It's keeping you from your next level because you won't clear even your own History. Who am I talking to today? In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, man, these scriptures are just like, poof, they blew up on the inside of me. I said, this is one of the greatest messages I'll ever minister. You've got to forgive and you've got to forget. Why? Do it like God does. What does God do? How does God do it? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 19 in the Amplify. It was God personally present in Christ, reconciling and restoring the world to favor with himself. Watch this. Not counting up. And holding against men their trespasses, but canceling them and committing to us the message of reconciliation, the restoration of favor. If we're going to do this the right way, if we're going to clear history, then we need to do it the way God does it and imitate him. How does he do it? He forgives us, right? But then he forgets about it. Notice he doesn't keep an account. Come here, brother Mark. Amen. He doesn't keep an account. The Bible says God doesn't count up. You Mark Tucker? Yes, I am. All right. And I remember you, you were 15. I saw you do that. <laughs> and then, you know, and then you got into it real deep in your 20s. I remember that too, right? No, God doesn't keep a record. What? He blots it out with the blood of Jesus as an example of what you and I can do in every one of our relationships. There's some of us who haven't talked to family members. We're broken in our family with our children, with our parents. We don't talk to them. Why? Because they came at the wrong day, wrong way, and we have cut them clean out of our lives. And it pleases God when families dwell together in unity. But because of hardness, you set up this wall. And you're doing the opposite of what God did. You count up how many times. You're remembering everything. And now you're holding against it. You're holding it against them. I remember you let me down. You lied to me. You, you were supposed to come pick me up at the bus stop. And you didn't come pick me up. <laughs> and in essence, it's really that simple. It's really that stupid. You know, we end up arguing over $100. But it's not the $100 we're arguing over. We're arguing over a history that's tied to this. this you know, see, that's exactly why. I, you know what? I thought I was going to let you do it, but you're not doing this. Why? Because of $100? You're thinking about divorce because of $100? It ain't $100. Oh, yeah, you're right. It's the history. And you're holding it. You won't let it go. But you know what God does? He doesn't count it up. and He don't hold it against them. He cancels it. God bless you. You can give him a hand, guys. I'm almost done. I know I'm long, but I'm almost done. In Luke chapter 17. You know what? I'll feed you. I'll feed you today. I'll feed you after the service. <laughs> Pastor Stan, you tripping, right? Yes, sir, I am right now. Amen. Luke chapter 17, verse 32. Verse 32. Rem say it out loud with me. Remember Lot's wife. 
Think about that. If you know the story, God sent deliverance so that they could experience better life. But because she was like some who forgive but never forget, she was never able to enter into the life that God designed for her because she looked back. One verse, three words. Remember Lot's wife. What did she do? All she did was look back. And in relationships, when things happen and we look back, we get frozen in that moment. She became a pillar of salt. Ash. Bitter. Harsh. Couldn't move forward. Died. For looking back. Here's another one. Luke chapter 9, verse 62. Verse 62, Jesus said, but he said to him, no one having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom. You can come up and play something soft for him. The spirit of God is ministering. When you said your marriage that plow and you tied your hand Or woman, looking back to how good it used to be. Looking back at things that have happened even up until this point is fit for experiencing life like God has it. That's what the kingdom of God is, life like God has it. Somebody say, looking back. Don't do it in a relationship. Don't bring it up in conversation. Forgive? Forget. If they bring it up, oh, you know what? Don't worry about that. Now, if there's something, a point that you're trying to make, we can talk about that. But as far as I'm concerned, you're forgiven. I forget about that. And we can move on. Philippians chapter 3. I, literally, I wish I could take weeks and just like each week preach on one part of this. I can't. We got other information to cover. But if you really, if you really want to get to that next level and experience happiness and, and joy and fulfillment, and there's nobody that can keep you from that. You've got to be a doer of the word, right? Go back, listen to the message again. If you find yourself struggling with forgiving and forget, go back over it. It's the Bible. It's not Pastor Stan. Philippians 3.13, brethren, I do not count myself to have learned anything. But one thing in the experience of my life, I have learned the greatest thing. I do this. I forget those things which are behind. And I reach forward to the things that are out in front of me. Your side view, Camp Mirror, and your rear view mirror are so small in comparison to what's out in front of you. You shouldn't let those things that are behind you rule and govern your life. I got mad at somebody this week because I mean they driving all funny like and it just seemed to me that he's spending more time looking at me in, in the rear view mirror than he is drive, drive up man come on what are you doing? Let me get to this third one. Woo! So you got to forgive. You got to forget. And this third one shocked me. Like I said, something happened this week. And it, it, it was a failed. It's not what, it wasn't what I wanted. It wasn't what I was expecting. totally caught me off guard. And it hurt me. And instantly I knew because of what we were learning that if I don't deal with this, then every time I see that situation, it's going gonna, it's gonna to trigger a little pain. And eventually something will pop out, you know, you know what, you know, you get that little attitude, something ends up coming out. And you know, that ought to be a telltale sign that you haven't really dealt with something if something comes up and pops out, right? This one got me. The Lord in my heart told me, yeah, you forgive. Yeah, you forget. But now I want you to act like everything is okay. I almost had to stop on that one. I was like, really, right? You know, I'm supposed to be like, hey, you know, how you doing? Hey, you know, great. 
And you just hurt me, right? Right? Act like everything is okay. Are you, are you for real, God? But then he put me in the context of what he was showing me, and it's really real. It's how God forgives. It's how he forgets. When he forgives us and forgets what we've done, he treats us, he acts like, Verse 7, back to the Amplified. He says, love bears up under anything and everything that comes is ever ready to believe the best of every person. His hopes are fadeless under all circumstances and endures everything without weakening. The word believe is an action word. It, it, it also means to act. When you believe, you act. So act like if, if you believe the best of that person, if you've forgiven them, forgetting it, then believe the best. Believe that when you forgave them in your heart that they got it and they're not going to do it again. Act like everything is okay. I know it's, I know it's a struggle. But notice, notice what God in his interaction with us. The Bible says, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you. How are you thinking about your spouse? How are you thinking about you and so you know what when I think about you I don't think about you according to your past that you've caused pain in my life I think about you thoughts of peace I think of thoughts of, of, of peace and not of evil to give you a hope and to give you a future act like everything is okay somebody say act like everything is okay the last one is in Romans chapter 5 verse 17 and when I saw this literally the Holy Spirit brought it to me I didn't have this before but in Romans chapter 5 and verse 17 it says for if by one man's offense when you sin against somebody you offense it's an offense it's a sin you cross a line for if by offense death reign because that person crossed the line now that relationship is dead or it's dying for if by one man's offense death reign through one much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness by it will reign in life through one in other words grace is when God gives you something that you don't deserve put it in context how does God love he forgives how does God forgive he forgets and then how does God act he acts like everything is okay he gives us not what we deserve he gives us what we don't deserve You know what righteousness is? Righteousness is the ability to stand in God's presence as if sin has never before existed. Come on, God's gift to you, even though you've messed up a thousand times, he loves you so he forgives you, he forgets about it, and then he treats you as if sin has never before existed. I'm challenging you today to give the gift of righteousness to the people that are in your life. Don't make them feel guilty. Don't make them feel a, a terrible as a result of what they said and what they did and how they let you down. Give them the gift of righteousness. Give them the gift that they don't deserve. Treat them as if it's okay. Come on, somebody. I pray that you got this word today. Woo! <laughs> so love like God loves. Forgive like God forgives. Give like God gives so you can live like God lives. Say that out loud. Love like God loves. Forgive like God forgives. And give like God gives so you can live like God lives. Y'all believe that? It'll make a difference in your life. Amen. Let me pray for you as we go. Father, I thank you for this, every man, every woman, under the sound of my voice. I pray that we not just be hearers of this word, but doers of it. Thank you for showing us how to clear history in our hearts. And now as we go from this place, if there's anyone present that doesn't know the Lord, I want you to hear this invitation. 